How's everybody doing this morning? Excellent. It's good to see you guys. Those that are joining us online, I'd like to welcome you as well. well. We've been in this series studying the life and the story of Joshua, really the book of, of Joshua. I'm just curious, how many of you had to really fight for something at some point in your life, right? Where you had to really stand your ground because there was something opposing you. Um, years ago, when I was in the fourth grade, I know it's hard to believe I can remember back that far. My brother's a year older than me. He was in the fifth grade. My brother's a really big guy. He's like a head, you know, and shoulders higher than me. He's like 6'4", and just a big guy. Probably weighed about 300 pounds, maybe two, actually not now, but 250 probably in the, a little over 200, 250 probably in the, in the fifth grade. And, and he was just a really quiet guy, okay? Really quiet guy. Big guy, really quiet guy. So he was a easy target. Like, you know how it is in school. Kids like to pick on guys, and if they can find a guy that's an easy target, a big guy, because he was a quiet guy, they picked on him. There was one kid in particular who just picked on him and picked on him and picked on him. And many times after school, we were on our way home, this kid would come up to him and just start swinging and pounding on my brother. And he would always, he had this strange way, but he put his head down and he would go like this. And it was like almost every week this guy would come up and do this. And neither one of us, my, me or him, were, were fighters. And he would just kind of try to push the kid away and kind of endure it, you know, and go home humiliated. And one day a friend of his said, you know what, next time this kid comes with his head down doing this, just lean your head back and go like this. And so sure enough, my, my brother, on this one day, this kid came up to him, put his head down, because my brother's just big, and started swinging at him like this, and my brother leaned back and started going like this. Well, after a bloody nose and a lot of crying, that kid never picked on my brother ever again, because he stood his ground. And, and I'm sharing that with you because of this. There are some things, especially when it comes to the kingdom of God, that are worth fighting for. And, and it takes effort in fighting to fight, to walk and live in the promises of God. And this is what we're experiencing as we're going through the book of, of Joshua, that, that we have to fight for the things that God has called us to. And we see in the book of Joshua that, that we are in not just, they were not just in a physical battle, they were in a spiritual battle. And so last week we were in chapter 7 where, where Israel, they just suffered a great defeat. Two, two chapters ago, not that long ago, with the Battle of Jericho, it was the stronghold in the land. They had this major victory. They're on a spiritual high. They're on an emotional high. Things are going great. And then they suffer defeat, all because of one guy by the name of Achan, who just had an Achan for some things that he wanted so bad. And it brought sin into the camp and made a mess of everything. And so what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at just how to overcome defeat and really just looking at turning a setback into a comeback. And really the title of this series is about being a warrior. And, and now we're kind of getting into this part of how the things of God are worth fighting for. And we got to fight for those things. And so today we're looking at Joshua chapter 8 and turning a setback into a comeback because this setback against this little town of I was a major defeat for them. It was humiliating. There's, there's a, a spiritual defeat. There's an emotional defeat. There's a mental defeat, right? All these, there's a physical, all these things. And, but it really, more than anything, it was a spiritual defeat. And many times, I think, in this life, we try to compartmentalize the spiritual from the physical. But the way God created us, it's all combined together. Right, you know, it's like I was just thinking why we worship. Sometimes we get excited, we raise our hands, right? We clap. Why? Because we're just not robots that are reading words. There's an emotion to part of what we're doing when it comes to worshiping God. It's all intertwined together. And so now there's this major setback, and now God's got to get his people back on track. And it's got to start with the leader. It's got to start with Joshua. And because of Achan, it's just been a mess of things. So now we're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 8, which the title of my Bible is The Israelites Defeat I. All right, so now we're, now we're going to get into the next big victory that's going to take place. But this is how chapter 8 begins after a big defeat. Um, chapter 8, Joshua 8, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Does that sound familiar? All right, why is God saying this? Because we go all the way back to Joshua chapter 1 at the very beginning. There was a major setback right? What was the major setback? Moses died. 
Now Joshua's got to try to figure out how he's going to fill these big shoes of a guy who carried a staff, who parted the Red Sea, who struck a rock and water gushed out, who built a serpent out of bronze that, that stopped the plague when the, God's people looked at it, who came down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments. And so Joshua at this point in time is this kind of hesitant, reluctant leader, and God says, look, do not be afraid or discouraged. All right, it's right there in the beginning of Joshua, Joshua 1, 8, and 9. It talks about this very thing. God says this over and over again. So now there's this major defeat. This is a major setback. Joshua is discouraged. It's like, how do we move forward from this place? And the very first thing God says is, do not be afraid or discouraged. And he goes on and says, the rest of verse 1 says, take all your fighting men and attack I. Right? And what's the next word? It says, see See, I have given you the king of Ai, his people, his town, and his land. Does this not sound familiar? Remember two chapters ago, chapter 6, when God was telling them to go in and what to do. He gave him all the specific directions when it comes to Jericho. The very first verse says, See, I have given Jericho into your hands. I've delivered him into your hands. So, so here's this key thing. When we go through this major setback, because we all go through setbacks in life, right? There's, there's things that just take place in life that are setbacks. And then there's personal setbacks. There's all kinds. And so here, what chapter 8 is all about is now God is going to walk Joshua and his people through how to turn a setback into a comeback. And there's some really good basic principles that we can learn from this. And so the first thing, number one, I want to suggest is this. What God is telling his people and what God is telling Joshua at the very first verse here is it starts with a focus forward faith. And God is telling Joshua, don't look back. Don't look back at the defeat. Don't look back at what happened. And he's not, I'm not suggesting that God is saying don't, don't learn from that, but don't look back. Focus forward. Yes, you suffered a defeat, but the key to overcoming and, and turning a setback into a comeback is focusing forward into what God has called us to in living by faith. See, I have done this. Even before it happens, God says that's what faith is. We talked about two, two weeks ago. So what I want to do is I want to kind of jump to the New Testament for a minute. And I'll look at a guy, the Apostle Paul, who, who has experienced a major setback. A guy who's full of zeal for the kingdom of God, for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, gets falsely accused of things, and then he gets put in prison. Thank God he got put in prison. Because during his imprisonment, he wrote some of the best letters that are the, in the New Testament and God's word for us today while he was in prison. And during one of his prison encounters, when he, he wrote to this church in Philippi, which is one of the amazing letters in the New Testament, and I would just want to take a minute and just read what he wrote, because he was talking about right before this, all the things that he could brag about, all the things from his past, but he said, here's the deal. This is in the book of Philippians chapter 3. Starting in verse 12, the Apostle Paul says this, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now I'm thinking about as he's writing this, I'm thinking, Paul, you're writing from prison. You have no freedom to go anywhere and do the things that, that's just burning in your heart to go and do. So all he can do is pen and pass these letters on to the churches. And he says, I, I press on and take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Now, he's, he's experiencing a setback right when he's writing this. He said, I'm forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make it clear to you. In other words, he's saying God's going to make it clear that this is how you live out your faith. You don't look back. You focus forward to the things of God and his kingdom. And then he throws in this, this verse here in verse 16. I think it's really pertinent here for Joshua um, as we go back and look at Joshua. He says, only let us live up to what we have already attained. 
And I think that's key there because sometimes when we have a setback, we're like, oh, man, I'm never going to I'm never going to become what God really wants me to become. I'm never really going to get back to where I was. And, and God's saying, no, I, you get back. Paul says you're going to get back. Live up to the level of which you've already attained in your faith. Yes, you may have experienced a setback, but you can get back to square one as far as God has brought you and start over and keep moving forward and growing in your faith. And so Paul says, let's live up to what, where we have already attained. So this is really what God is dealing with with Joshua. You've already experienced a greater victory in what's going to happen with I, and he's calling him back to square one to get back on track. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. See, I've already given you I, the king, and everything into your hands. And so as we walked through last week, part of this whole process is this whole thing of, of just changing direction. Humility, we're talking about humbling ourselves before God. When there was sin in the camp, the very first thing was humbling ourselves before God. And this is a cycle we see in the Christian faith. Humility, and then when there, if there's sin, repentance. And repentance is not, you know, just somebody pointing at you saying, you need to stop doing what you're doing. Repentance is a change of direction. It's a change of mind. I'm no longer living for the flesh. I'm no longer living for the sinful nature. I'm no longer living for myself. I'm now changing direction and trusting God and his word. And now there's this other piece. There's humility, repentance, and then, you know, forgiveness is part of that. We looked at last week. And then it's living, getting back on track and having a focused forward faith and living out to what God has called us to. And we see this over and over again, right? Because we all go through setbacks. And we go through a setback, it's just this cycle. We go before God, humble ourselves before him, what's going on, how did I get here? And now God's telling Joshua that he went through this whole thing of repentance, cleaning, killing up, you know, God dealt severely with sin that was in the camp, and now it's like, now it's time to get back on track and live out your faith with a focused forward faith. Don't look back, focus forward. That's what God's calling to. See, I've done this. Verse 2, this is what God's speaking to Joshua. Here's what's going to happen. He says, you will destroy them as you destroyed Jericho and its king. See the connection? He's saying, I don't want you to look, 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 you know, look back. God, it's what I've, look, I've already done this. See, I've done this. And what you did to Jericho, we're going to get right back to the level that you attained. Right. All right, so what I did with Jericho, this is what's going to happen here. But this time, notice this key thing in here. But this time you may keep the plunder and the livestock for yourselves. How foolish the sin of Achan is now. Had he just waited. Right? And I think, you know, when I, when I read these things, I'm sitting there thinking, man, isn't this our story? Isn't Joshua's story our story? If we would just trust God at his word. If we would just kind of hold out and wait that his promises are good, his promises are true. And yet Achan just had an Achan to have that, that, that robe from Babylon and that silver and that gold bar. He just had to have it. And here, if he'd have just waited, God would have given him his heart's desire. But he brought sin into the camp and made a mess of everything. And, and I just want to suggest this. When it comes to us living out our faith, I think one of the things where we get tripped up often, I'm just going to put this up here on the screen to bullet points when I was thinking as I was putting this together this week, is it's easy to self-sabotage the life that Jesus gives us. Isn't it? It's just easy to self-sabotage because we're, we're so antsy. We're, you know, especially in our culture, we want everything now. We just don't want to wait. And God says, just trust. Part of trusting is waiting. Part of hoping is, is waiting that God is good and God is faithful to his word. And so what God is calling Joshua back to in order to turn this setback, this defeat into a comeback, it starts with having a focused forward faith. Don't look back at the failure. Don't look back at what happened. Don't focus on the defeat. I am giving you the city. Just as I did in Jericho, you're going to see it. You're going to walk this thing out. Trust me at my word. That's what God is telling Joshua at the beginning of chapter 8 here. This is the last part of verse 2 going on here. God now gives Joshua some strategic moves to take against the city of Ai. So here's what God tells him. He says, set an ambush behind the town. Now, isn't it interesting that God gives strategic advice, strategic military advice? Isn't that what God's word is? He gives us from the beginning to the end 
strategy on how to live out our faith, how to take the things of his word and make it practical in our lives to live this thing out. And here, after a defeat, now God is giving him a strategy. The first thing is, I want you to live by faith, focus forward faith. And he says, I want you to set an ambush behind the town. So Joshua responds, verse 3. It says, so Joshua and all the fighting men sent out to attack I. Joshua chose 30,000 of his best warriors and sent them out at night. Now, here's what I find really interesting as I was studying this week, is that God gives some specifics. He doesn't give all the details, but he gives some specifics. He says, here, I want you to set an ambush. But what's interesting is that God gives us this, this freedom, this free will to work his word into our lives as we live it out. So he's giving Joshua some room to take the strategy and to implement it as he sees fit as a warrior. And so what's interesting here is he's taking these fighting men out to attack I, and this time it says that Joshua chose 30,000 not just of, of any warriors, it says of his best warriors and sent them out. Now, now remember last week when they suffered defeat, there was only 3,000. <laughs> because the spies that he sent out to I came back and they're like, Joshua, these guys, I think these men were living by faith. They're like, look, we know what God can do. It's really rough terrain, you know, rocky terrain. We don't need to wear everybody out. Let's just send a smaller amount of our troops out there. So only 3,000 of them went, but because there was sin in the camp, they were defeated. This time, as God's given him some strategy, Joshua says, no, I'm taking more. And he gets 30,000, but not just 30,000, but of his best warriors. The book of Proverbs tells us that there is safety in numbers. Now, I think this is a key thing, and God may have given him some input on this as he's kind of worked this ambush out, but, but here's part of, I think, a second part of the strategy we see here that God is kind of directing Joshua in when it comes to turning a setback into a comeback. The second thing is this. Not only do we need to, the first thing is to have a focus forward faith, but the second thing is, is that God is just giving him these instructions is to surround yourself with the best warriors. Just don't, take, just don't hang out with anybody. Chapter, chapter 7 was like just 3,000. All it said was 3,000 warriors. In chapter 8, it says he took his very best warriors. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm going through some really challenging things in my life, there's a handful of people that I know that I can call on, that I go to, to be in my corner. Now, when I say that, do, is there people that come to you, to you in mind? When you're going through some really hard stuff, are there people that you call or text to ask you to pray for them? Right? And, you know, and there's a number of them in our church. And they're ones that I would say are our warriors. Some of them are just really good prayer warriors. And it's not that the rest of the people aren't, aren't effective. We all have our different skills and gifts. But we know there are just some people that are really good warriors, prayer warriors, that we know will go before God and they will pray I, I will get with them. I'll have them come. I'll have them surround me. I'll have them pray over me. Some of them are more seasoned to me. They're farther along in their journey. And I get the very best around me that I know have seasoned warriors, right? Because that's the way God designed us. And so it's a key thing here. Joshua's getting the very best to be around him as he's going here to attack the city of Ai. And so we have to come back and understand that we are in the middle of a spiritual battle as long as we breathe the breath of life on this earth, we are in a spiritual battle until our Savior comes and rescues us from sin and death when it's completely consummated. We are in a spiritual battle, and we are called to live by faith. We will have setbacks, and it is so important that we surround ourselves with the very best warriors. It's important that we become the very best warriors for others in our lives. So my challenge, as I'm going to be pushing this fall, as we're as getting into the fall season, we're back to school, is as I'm in, in a couple of weeks, I'm just really going to be doing a push to get as many people in our church connected in life groups and in ministry groups because it is so important that we surround ourselves with warriors that are there with us. And, and what, what, we're going to make it simple. It'll only be maybe for seven weeks, a seven-week stretch of connecting together in biblical community, and it's because this is what God has called us to. Nearly 50 times in the New Testament, it is commanded to one another. It is not an option. It is a command. 
because God knows that we need the very best warriors around us because we are in a spiritual battle and we will all go through setbacks of various kinds throughout this life. And God wants each and every one of us to be a life changer, to be a warrior in somebody else's life to help them live out this faith. So, so God is giving him this strategy. Joshua gets 30,000 of his best warriors to go do this. There's the, the war taking place, and then here's what's going on. Verse 4 picks up. This is Joshua again. He says, with these orders, he tells them this, hide in ambush. This is what God told him. Hide in ambush close behind the town. And what are these next words here? He says, and be ready for action. Does this not sound like the New Testament? Be ready for action, where Peter actually says, always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is in you. The whole call in Scripture is to be ready for action. So he's saying, we're going to hide in ambush, but be ready for action, because we are in the middle of a spiritual battle. So the battle's taking place. They're right in the middle of the heat of the battle. I'm going to skip down. I'm not going to walk through all the battle stuff. Verse 18. God then gives Joshua some more strategy here in the midst of the heat of the battle, picking up verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said to Joshua, Point the spear in your hand toward I, for I will hand the town over to you. And Joshua did as he was suggested. As he was commanded. Right Now here's what I want you to see here. Remember the time of Moses... When, when he was at war and God told him to raise his staff. And when he held up his staff, God's people were having victory. But his arms grew weak over time. And as the staff came down, the enemy started having victory. The staff represents authority. The authority that God gave Moses. And so he needed people around him. And so he had Aaron and her who came and held up his arms. And as long as that staff was held up, they were there to support him. Around him, they had victory and they won the war. There's a very similar thing. God is trying to empower Joshua here in this moment. Trying to help him overcome a setback and make it into a comeback. And he said, I want you to take the spear that it's in your hand and I want you to point it. Towards the city of I, take the spear, the authority of my word that I've given you, and point it towards where I'm going to give you victory. When we get into the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he tells us to be ready for action. He tells us to put on the whole armor of God. And there's one offensive weapon that he gives us, and he tells us about it. He says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to use it against the attacks of the enemy. All the other things, the breastplate, the belt of truth, all the other armor is protective. The sword of the Spirit is offensive, and God is calling Joshua to go on the offensive. He's telling us to live on the offensive. And so the third part of turning this setback into a comeback, number three is here, is God is telling his people this, be ready for action by standing in the truth and the authority of the Word of God. That's how we got to live this thing out. This is how we turn a setback into a comeback. We have a a faith, a focus forward faith. We surround ourselves with the best warrior. And when we are in the heat of the battle, which happens many times, we're to be ready for action and we're to stand on the truth and the authority of the word of God. Moses' rod represented authority. Joshua's spear is representing authority. And God says, point it towards the city. For I am with you, and I'm going to give you victory today. And so God has called him to go on the offensive, and God is calling us to go on the offensive. And the the reason why is because as they went into the promised land, God knew all of the things of culture that were going to creep into their lives if they weren't careful. And so they had to be ready for action and take their stand on the authority of God's word. And this is what Josh was doing. This is how he's leading God's people. And we live in a culture where there's all kinds of things that will pull us in and lure us in. And if there's one thing that is eroded away over time in our culture is the authority of God's word. Everybody's an authority today. Right? 
And there is no authority. There is no absolute. And God is the, the creator and the author of life. And he's given us his word. And he's telling Joshua to stand on the authority of his word that he's given him and to take the weapon that's in his hand and use it going on the offensive. And this is what God is calling us to do in Christ, to know the word and to do the word. When Jesus was tempted, before Jesus changed the world, he was out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was fasting, and he was praying, seeking the heart of God, and he was hungry. And it was right then when he was vulnerable, the enemy shows up, and he says, Hey, dude, you've got the power. All you got to do is tell that stone right there to become a nice, warm, fresh loaf of bread. I can smell it now. All you got to do is say the word, and it's yours, and you can eat it. Doesn't that make you hungry right now? <laughs> and it would have been very tempting But what did Jesus do? He refuted him by quoting God's word. He went back on the offensive. He says, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And two more times, Satan tried to tempt him. One of those times, he even took God's word and twisted it against him. And Jesus stood his ground and took the offensive. He was ready for action, and he did it by taking the authority of the word of God to thwart the schemes of the enemy. And when he came out of that, he went forth and changed the world and poured out his life on a cross for us. And so this is what God is calling Joshua to. Let's go on to verse 30. Here's, here's what happens. They have this great victory. Joshua's following all the commands of God. And here's the end of the chapter. Here's what Joshua does in response to the victory. Verse 30. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. 31. He followed the commands that Moses, the Lord's servant, had written in the book of instructions. It's referring to the book of the law. Um, the, the books of Moses, the gave us Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is specifically focusing on Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Those are the books that, that has all the stuff of the law in it. And it said this, Make an altar from stones that are uncut and have not been shaped with iron tools. Then on the altar they, are present, they presented burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. So here's this pattern of implementing of humbling themselves before God. This, this pattern of humility, right? Repentance, forgiveness, and worship. Okay, they're, they're coming before God, presenting these burst, burnt offerings and peace offerings as God commanded them before they even got into the promised land through Moses. They're coming together, they're worshiping together, they're giving God the glory for the victory. It's always by God that we have victory. Verse 32, and as the Israelites watched, Joshua copied onto the stones of the altar the instructions, right, of the book of the law Moses had given them. Then all the Israelites, foreigners and native-born alike, along with the elders, officers, and judges, were divided into two groups. One group stood in front of Mount Gerizim, the other in front of Mount Ebal, so they're kind of separated on each side, and each group faced the other And between them stood the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. There in the plains is the the priests, the Levitical priests with the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence is. And they're, they're at the foot of these mountains facing each other. It is a perfect place to worship. It was served as like an amphitheater. Jesus often took advantage of these kind of locations. And this is where they stood. And it says, This was all done according to the commands that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had previously given for what purpose? For blessing the people of Israel. God always has blessing in mind for his people. If we just believe him and trust him, and hold out for him to bring the blessing. Verse 34, Joshua then read to them all the blessings and curses Moses had written in the book of instruction. Verse 35, every word of every command that Moses had ever given was read to the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and children, the foreigners who lived among them. Why is that so important? Because we've got to know the word. And we've got to know how to do the word. 
And God is telling Joshua to, to take these commands that was given through Moses. When you get to this place in the promised land, this is so key. Take these words and etch them on the altar so they don't forget. It's all about remembering, right? The 12 stones. It's all about remembering the circumcision. They were, they were bearers of the covenant. It's all about remembering who we are in Christ. And part of that is knowing the word and hearing the word and doing the word. And we see this pattern throughout the scripture. I was going to put a couple bullet points up here. Because we see this taking place throughout the book of Joshua. When we try to do things, on, do things our way, it always ends in defeat. Right? When we try to take matters into our own hands, and we see it throughout biblical history, we see it throughout the history of God's people, whenever we try to take matters into our own hand and do things our way, it always ends in defeat. However, the next bullet point I have here is when we trust God at his word and do as he commands, it always ends in defeat victory. And it will always bring us back to a place of worship because our God is faithful to his word. And so in order to turn a setback into a comeback, what God is telling Joshua here, just these practical things in chapter 8, is I want you not to look back, but to focus forward, have a focus forward faith. You got to surround yourself with the very best warriors. And you got to be ready for action and stand on the authority authority of the word of God in your life and put it to use. And the last thing, number four, is this, is just kind of the wrap up we see in chapter eight is commit to following the commands of God. And when we do that, we will change the world with the good news of Christ. And that's what our mission statement is all about. It all starts with loving God. Right? That is the first and the greatest command, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And we have to do that daily by connecting with him. And then we, the way we reinforce that is we come together. We see in the book of Joshua. We see it throughout the scriptures. We see it in the New Testament. They came together and they met together. They worshiped together. Hearing God's word, worshiping together as a people, surrounding ourselves with other warriors. That's where the loving others comes in. It starts with loving people through just one anothering in the scripture, you know, in, in the body of Christ. And then we have the ability to change the world and go and do it with the good news of Christ. Amen. Let's pray.